question to President Obama and Secretaries Geithner and Donovan to address stabilization and recovery in our housing market and banking system. So you've made a lot of recommendations. I'm asking you to sort through them for me. But let me just make a comment that those Wall Street speculators who rigged our housing market to earn huge profits for a very long time through securitization have got Congress just where they want us. They've got us playing with twigs when the forest is burning. And the perpetrators are still making huge profits, taking obscene bonuses and laughing all the way to their brokers, and I have no doubt laughing at all of us. Some of our colleagues are trying to make this a partisan issue. Um, I don't look at it that way. I'm very critical of the massive Wall Street investment houses in cahoots with the Federal Reserve that led us into this abyss. And our federal government was full of top-level appointees over several administrations who came from those very same institutions making all the money. This crisis is due to a revolving door of influence peddling of extraordinary proportion. It goes back two decades, regardless of who was president and regardless of who sat in this Congress. Wall Street simply used its power with a vengeance, and they still are. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I want to thank you for your testimony. You speak for the American people who have been harmed. You speak for the people of my district. Your voice is very clear, and it is very important. One of the questions I have of you, and then we'll open it up to the other witnesses here, you produced the keys this morning. Um, let me ask you this. To your knowledge, could each family who had one of those keys, would the institution that financed their loan during a foreclosure proceeding be able to produce the original note in that proceeding or only a copy or some sort of facsimile of it? And what is your opinion about the legality of that in foreclosure proceedings? Well, of course, the courts have ruled that they do need to produce those documents, several state courts. Uh, are several, in several states, they've ruled that they need to produce the uh, certificate of ownership. And, they, and some of these, uh, many of these financial institutions have had difficulty doing that because, well, here's a loan that New Century made. Here's a loan that Option One made. Here's a loan that AmeriQuest made. Here's a loan that Countrywide made. And it goes on and on and on, all these businesses which no longer exist. And when, as they sold off these things through this, you know, Ponzi scheme involving Wall Street to just move all this paper out from local communities and brokers and, and lenders, uh, the certificate of ownership did not trail them. They just kept moving the paper and moving the profits and everybody taking fees along the way. So uh, generally, if you or I were, were suing somebody for anything and we were claiming that, you know, I had the right and the ownership over this, we would have to produce something for the court that's, that in fact signifies that. And the fact that they can't ought to stop the proceeding unless and until they're able to do that. Yes, and why aren't our judges doing that across the country? Do they well, not know the law? <laughs> why aren't the judges doing it? Well, some judges are, I'm, I'm happy to say, in different circuits. But uh, for those states, for governors and elected officials who are looking to try to prevent the, f the level of foreclosures that continue to rise in their, in their congressional dis districts, they might want to send a letter to the judges to inform them about Sir, this if legality. I could see, I hope you go address the National Sheriff's Association. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a job that your organization could do to get this word out, because I think we have to fight back yeah. uh, it, with every weapon we have. Um, and um, there isn't much time for the other panelists to answer at this point but I very much would appreciate top recommendation that you would say to the President right now to address the concerns that you brought before us today. Well, our, our unadopted recommendation in this report is re-examining the, the vulnerability of this program to redefault. Uh, and I, I do think that's essential, and Treasury has, has indicated they will not, uh, without doing so, uh, that the program is going to be vulnerable to one where mortgages are, even those that, may, that make permanent modifications, may drop out with a total waste of taxpayer money and even potentially harming some of those homeowners. So I think reassessing and evaluating and, and coming up with ideas to address the vulnerabilities to redefault would be, very quickly, would be, 
would be the unanswered recommendation in our report. Mr. Barofsky, I'd also appreciate from you an evaluation of Franklin Roosevelt's Homeowners Loan Corporation. Several members have sent a letter over to Secretary Geithner asking him to take a look at that. I hear what you're saying to me about the existing program. The existing program is a failure. We have to look at other structures that we need to recommend to the administration. And I would be very va your your experience, your knowledge would be very valuable to us if you're able to do that within your authority. Uh, I would say okay. because economic circumstances are different, different parts of the country, borrowers are in different circumstances, top recommendation would be to, for Treasury is to institute the other facets of their program, the second lien modification, the mortgage alternative program, the uh, hardest hit program which begins to deal with some negative equity and deal with people who have lost their jobs. So you need a range of alternatives. Right now the only one is the second lien or excuse me, first lien program, you need more options. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Clay. Thank you, Chairman Clay. Uh, Mr. Borofsky, uh, your, your audit is uh, very forthright. This is just, this is a failure. This program is a failure and it's a waste of taxpayer dollars. Uh, but there are interesting insights. What, what did you discover about this modification program in terms of homeowners who get temporary modifications but then uh, fail to get the permanent uh, workout? Yes, we, we believe a lot of this is being, um, and, and one of the problems about redefault and the reasons for redefault is that Treasury hasn't yet been collecting data. They're going to be collecting data in 2010. Um, but we believe that one of the primary reasons for this was the absence of documented, fully documented um, verification of income at the outset of the program. Treasuries uh, encouraging in order to meet certain mileposts for trial modifications uh, was encouraging these verbal modifications and I think that has, has fueled a, a lot of what you're discussing. The, the, the reason why they're not being converted and dropping out. So verbal modifications. So basically stated income. Yes. Which is uh, I, I believe from uh, the rhetoric of this administration which is exactly what got us into this with the subprime marketplace is how much do you make? Well, yeah. whatever you say you make. And so in essence, gov the government policy has been able to, has been to take uh, private sector subprime loans and make them public sector subprime loans. The, there is a similarity to the, the, the liar loans uh, that I investigated as a mortgage fraud prosecutor. So very similar? Uh, similar in that it, it, in entering into the trial portion of the program just on stated income. It didn't work then, it's not working now. Um, and, and look, to Treasury's credit, they, they've identified that it's not working and as of April 15th, they'll no longer be accepting verbal modifications, but it was one of the driving causes of this huge backlog and, and low numbers of conversions. Okay, so your audit also uh, says that those that get a permanent workout have a very high risk of default. We don't know what the risk is, but we do think that it's vulnerable for redefault. It is a, uh, there, are, there are several aspects of the program that make it vulnerable to redefault, uh, and that is a real danger of this program for its long-term success. Such as? Um, well, for example, you know, negative equity is, is one of the highest predictors of redefault, and the, the average HAMP modification, the loan is underwater. And you know, as if left unaddressed, along with the other, other factors, um, there is a, you know, the statistics show that, that negative equity can lead to high areas of redefault. Also, the, the amount of whether these payments will ultimately be, still be affordable. Uh, the, the percentages and the models don't account for other debt, uh, crushing credit card debt and other debt that may make even a modified payment unaffordable. Also, the structure of the program is that it's, we call them permanent modifications, but they're not permanent. They last for five years, and then the interest rate starts to reset a lot like some of the, the subprime loans that, that you were referring to earlier. Um, and in, we just give one example where within a couple of years at the end of the program, uh, the payment could go up as much 23 percent, which again will put pressure on potential redefault if the income doesn't go up in, in, in a commensurate amount. Okay. And what did your audit find about the Treasury's pressure on servicers to modify these loans? Well, we had one servicer who responded that based on the public pressure um, that was the Treasury was exerting to increase trial modifications uh, that they changed their they changed the way that they did business they went from doing um, docu fully documented modifications to, to verbal Mr. Dodaro in his testimony today um, they in GAO and I, again I don't want to speak for GAO he could speak on this but but they've indicated very similar types of patterns and I'll, I'll defer to my colleague to explain that certainly 
Yeah, but basically, uh, the uh, ratio of high debt to income is a predictor uh, of, of redefaults. And part of the requirements in the Treasury was to get those particular borrowers with high ratios like that into counseling to help them understand the situation. And, and this is one recommendation that we've made to Treasury that they haven't yet implemented. We think it's important and really will help address as best as possible uh, this question of trying to minimize the read defaults as long as well as having this uh, uh, mortgage alternative program available. So up front, if the decision is made going forward that the trial modification doesn't make sense, there's a smooth exit strategy for short sales or other purchases to get, move the, uh, you know, help the borrower get reallocated. And that's not a part of current Treasury policy? Uh, that program has been in the works but not yet implemented. That program, the second lien program, and this other one on hardest hit areas uh, fund are not operational yet and need to be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. McHenry. Uh, we will now uh, recognize Ms. Spear of California Five Minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of the witnesses for appearing here today. You know, listening to this testimony is, is very discouraging. I think of this program as a program of death by a thousand cuts. It has failed. It has failed miserably. And unfortunately, we are incapable of saying, all right, this was an experiment. It didn't work. Let's try something else. And we just start layering more and more regulations, more and more elements to it. Half of all the foreclosures are negative equity loans right now. Half of them have already redefaulted. Half of them have second liens. And in this program, we don't consider non-mortgage debts as a factor in the modified payment. We are setting ourselves up for failure. The program doesn't work. Now, on top of everything else, it's voluntary. And let me give you an example from my district. This is a homeowner in Daly City. He had an IndyMac loan of $609,000 with a 6.75% interest, a payment of $3,500 a month. He works at FedEx. He's had a steady job there, but they have reduced his hours. He lives and takes care of his 89-year-old mother, lives with her, at, who, and his mother is a survivor of three breast cancers. He qualifies for making home affordable and has made all the trial plan payments on time confirmed delivery and contacts them bi-weekly to be sure that they have everything they need. And yet, they are still not converting his loan to a permanent modification, and they have set a date for sale of that home for April 7th. Now that is a travesty, an absolute travesty. I'm suggesting that we scrap this program, put all of these people who are in foreclosure, in a rental status, in their homes, with the banks, create some kind of you know, lease with option to buy, take that money that we've set aside for this program, subsidize the banks if necessary to keep them in their homes, wait this out for a year or two, and see if we can create a means by which they not only continue to live in their homes, but they can recreate some kind of equity in their homes moving forward. Now, that's just one idea of what there may be many. And my question to all of you is, if this gentleman in Daly City who's doing it right, who's in a trial modification program, who has made the payments on a hefty loan, is having his home put up for sale in a matter of weeks, how can we say this program has any positive effect at all? Question to all of you. I, I, I think you hit the nail right on the head that, you know, whether this program can be saved or whether a new program needs to be instituted, there has to be a reevaluation. There has to be some self-reflection. There has, Treasury needs to take a look at why these problems are occurring, where the dangers are, and make informed decisions. And that's a lot of what we've been talking about today, whether it's, you know, their refusal to, to reevaluate for redefault, uh, our recommendation, or something as simple as setting uh, goal posts and you know meaningful goals and measuring performance against those goals because if you don't do that you can't have that type of self-reflection that that self-assessing of, of how to fix it so I, I think that you know the concerns that you raise are similar to the concerns that we raise um, and it, 
Treasury is going to need to take a good hard look at this program, look at these concerns, and decide if they want to continue this program, if it is fixable, or whether to try something on, in the alternative. I, I oh, uh, first, you need to explore other alternatives, and, I, and we, we agree with that. And we think some of the other alternatives that Treasury has been planning are viable and should be tried as well. Uh, but you have 800,000 people in these active trial modifications right now that need to be dealt with equitably. They entered into this in good faith, uh, and they need to be dealt with. They don't have an appeal process. If they're running into difficulty, we think they need an appeal process. There needs to be good communication. There needs to be uh, the servicers held for compliance. I mean, we sort of set this in motion. We can't abandon it without properly treating these people in this, in this period. But you need other alternative programs, and certainly that needs to be uh, addressed. And your idea, among others, or, or, or need to be explored. Your point about an appeal process is, is helpful. It would be helpful to this constituent of mine. But again, the whole system is so arbitrary. It's voluntary, and it's arbitrary, and it's not working. So, I mean, I can see where we need to take care of those who are in some trial modification, but this gentleman is in a trial modification. His house is being sold from out from under him. Uh, all I can say is that's why we made recommendations to Treasury last July to put these processes in place and to make sure there was a compliance program with the providers. I mean, I'm not sure what the specifics are here, you know, obviously, uh, but there needs to be a process in place so that people are dealt with in a due process fashion and they get good answers and they have uh, uh, somewhere to go for help. There is a hotline now they can call, but that hasn't proven to always work effectively. The gentlewoman's time has expired. Gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank our witnesses. You know, coming from a large Midwestern city, with much of it being inner city, I can't tell you the number of foreclosures that exist in many of the communities that I represent. But as I've listened to the testimony, I was struck by the recommendations that the general lady from California made, and I think she would have been an excellent Secretary of the Treasury, or at the very least, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. And that's because I believe very, very strongly in the concept that if you start with a faulty premise, you're going to arrive at a faulty conclusion. And I think many of the concepts in this program were faulty from the beginning. And so it was inevitable that it becomes the failure that people are expressing or that we're not experiencing any more success with it than what we are experiencing. I also don't believe that you can defend the indefensible that you simply are going around and around and around and around in circles. But let me ask you, Mr. Borowski, who is the typical HAMP participant? I mean, who is the typical homeowner facing foreclosure who attempts to make use of the program? I'm not able to answer that question, but I think that that is a question that, uh, that, that many have raised the Congressional Oversight Panel raised this issue in their October report, um, and, and, and it goes to the very question of is this program designed, who is this program designed to help? Is it the homeowner who signed up for a, a predatory loan with a resetting option arm that reset to, to 8 or 9 percent and an increase of $3,000 a month? Or is it the, the, the hardworking family that, that perhaps had a, a, even a prime fixed rate um, mortgage but lost their job and are unable to, to, to make necessary payments. Um, but I think, it, I think it's an important question. We have you know, the medium information, how much you know, the, the medium loan and what the, the medium interest rate and the medium deduction, but I don't think that's really what your, what your question is asking. Are there, are there ceilings, uh, uh, floors? I, mean, I, I know people who've got mortgages of 350 thousand dollars who earn sixty five seventy thousand dollars a year and of course for the sake of me I couldn't imagine 
how they managed to acquire that. And the question, is there any salvation for them to salvage whatever it is they've put into this and get out of it? Mr. Taylor, would, would, would you respond? Yes. Uh, the, uh, the, the average, uh, let me just say that the, the typical person going through the program is all ethnicities, mostly modest income, um, disproportionately older, uh, older being 50 and older, and uh, most with families with children. Um, the, the, on your second question? Uh, the, 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 the high mortgage. Yeah, so, so yes, sorry. The, the, abil the way the program is designed is to get the housing cost down to 31 percent of the household income. That's the goal. So the, the two methods for that to happen is for the servicer or the lender to reduce either interest, principal, or both. The problem is that most of what has occurred has been interest deduction, and we now understand we're not going to get very far without principal reduction. The other alternative for the family you presented is some sort of a patient, you know, non-foreclosure uh, scenario where they have time to be able to either sell their home uh, or, uh, or to find uh, additional employment which could ratchet up their income to be able to handle that size of mortgage. But those are the two methods that are available. One of the, be available. When the crisis hit, I mean, one of the recommendations that some of the community groups and people really tempted to deal made was that, you know, you, you, you try and keep people in a property mm -hmm. because if you actually foreclose on it, everybody loses right. in that transaction. That is, the property loses its value, whatever value it had in a relatively short period of time. In many of the communities that I represent, if somebody moves out of one in two weeks, <laughs> it's decimated. I mean, whatever mm -hmm. was there is gone. So this question of, of working out agreements where people might be able to rent until they reach the point where they can actually pay a mortgage or if there's the possibility of not only salvaging what they've put in, but the property, the asset itself. How does that idea approach? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I think we are all impacted by continuing continuing mounting foreclosures. We all lose. People who are paying on their mortgage, who have a prime mortgage, have no problem paying their mortgage. They watch the, their household value, their house value continue to deteriorate every time there's a foreclosure uh, within a block of their, their house. Then when you have multiple foreclosures, there's a rapid decline in value. So we're all losing, as I said earlier, roughly $7 trillion in, in uh, home equity has been lost by the American public. So I, I don't agree with the Congresswoman from California about let, let's just let them all fail and you know, a uh, year later we'll sort of pick up the pieces, let's find some rental situations. I think if we allow another 8 million homes to go into foreclosure, it will have a devastating, devastating effect on our economy and the job losses will continue to rise. Let me thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I agree with you because I believe that wherever there is a will, there is a way, mm -hmm. and that if we would have the courage to make the kind of decisions that need to be made, we could, in fact, salvage many of these properties, turn them around, and salvage everything that people have put into them. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for this hearing, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, and thank the gentleman. I. Uh, you know, every day I, I hear from constituents uh, who are among the over 4 million Americans who are going through foreclosure and uh, are facing pending foreclosure and suffering with underwater home values. Uh, just this month, foreclosure rates hit an all-time record high uh, in St. Louis in my hometown. Uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, just this week, the National Urban League reported uh, that blacks and other people of color are suffering from the housing crisis at far higher rates than whites, and yet, according to your research, 
Uh, you report racial disparities in that minority bar borrowers are less likely than whites to receive trial and permanent modifications. Uh, can you explain your methods and these findings further? Yes. Um, essentially, we have a dual system of mortgage finance in this country, one for whites and one for blacks. And it's really unfair. And if most people really understood just how unfair it is, most, most Americans really think we should not tolerate it. I mean, make no mistake about it, communities, black and brown communities were targeted by subprime high cost lenders after the banks had left and abandoned those neighborhoods and closed their branches. So that, we're, and let's face it, when we're talking about minority, whether it's black or brown, we're still talking about people who are working, you know, and people, you know, perhaps their income isn't as high, but they're people who are working, they have families, they have all the same hopes and dreams of any other uh, family in America. But the available basic banking services for that population are payday lenders, check cashes, and pawn shops. That's a disgrace. The available mortgage lenders are these fly-by-night options, uh, or fly-by-night independent companies that set up the little shops and advertise low rates and whatever and tease people in with these rates only to give them, you know, loans that are totally inappropriate, that they know are unsustainable. That is what really happened. And, and now people trying to get out of those situations, even now, under the mortgage modification programs that are available, are still even now being disproportionately treated along racial lines. And can you surmise that um, uh, from this data, uh, from the steering that occurred, mm -hmm. steering people of color into subprime and predatory loans mm -hmm. contributed to the housing crisis that we are experiencing now. Yes, I mean that what you see, uh, the average, a typical neighborhood seven years ago in America would see one or two percent subprime loans. Mm -hmm. But you would go into African American and Hispanic communities and you would see, I'm not exaggerating, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of the mortgages made in those neighborhoods were high cost subprime unsustainable loans. And I see it in middle class neighborhoods in my district in North St. Louis mm -hmm. County. Mm -hmm. I see that, and, and these people are pretty much middle income earners. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you, do, do you have any suggestions I on do. how we close the racial gap? Well, first off, there's, there's nothing like sunshine uh, to, to show what is occurring and being very crystally clear about the difference in treatment and who's getting what, who's not getting what, who's being offered mm -hmm. the types of loans. So. There's no question that the ability to produce data has, has elevated the conversation and the ability to make assessments in this area, but a lot more needs to be done. Even in the HAMP and the HOP programs, it's very difficult to get data from these people, which drives me crazy because these are government agencies and there's no proprietary stuff about this. Why aren't they sharing this data with this committee and with everybody else, the GAO and everybody else, so we can really analyze what's going on? That's one of the things that ought to happen. But the, the recommendation that I would make, uh, first, we, we really need to revisit the issue of judicial modification to protect people from losing their homes. Secondly, um, take away the voluntary aspect of HAMP, make it mandatory, lenders have to participate, there has to be principal write down and interest write down. Instruct Fannie and Freddie tomorrow to refinance the millions of loans that they have on their books, that they have their capability and authority to do right now, to refinance those loans into workable, sustainable those, loans. Those sub, subprime and predatory loans? Yes. Okay. Yeah, of which the, the estimates that they have somewhere between 400 to 600 billion dollars worth of those loans, or four to five million. Um, use all these vacant houses as a job creation program, all these foreclosures, you know, begin to train people to become carpenters, plumbers, electricians, sheet metal workers, roofers, and so on, to rehabilitate a lot of these homes, which as somebody pointed out earlier, become abandoned, become a, a, a stress on the local uh, government and local community. Train people to rehabilitate and bring, and bring up to code and even weatherize these programs. That will create jobs and at the same time create decent affordable housing and affordable rental housing. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, which has been offered, I mean, this House passed a bill, and I applaud it for its version, but unfortunately the Senate has undermined your initiative by taking 
the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau and putting it in the Federal Reserve and then putting oversight of the bank regulators, the very people who failed to enforce all the laws and regulations we had to prevent this kind of calamity, are now going to be the oversight board and, and, and be able to veto and control what comes out of that bo board. I hope you guys really fight in this conference committee when the Senate's done weakening this, this legislation that you really fight to create a, a meaningful Consumer Finance Protection Board. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see it publicized on television and mm -hmm. to see just who's shilling for who. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. This panel is dismissed. Too bad it wasn't just you and me. <laughs> that better <laughs> guy agree. I expected them to get one of the questions, I guess. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I'll just throw them in there. Thank you.